My name is Maurice Dussault. I'm a member of WISE uh, for many years. My work is mainly in geomechanics and subsurface energy issues. But uh, because of my background in geophysics as well, uh, we've come up with an idea that we'd like to try out. Uh, I'm titling this Helping People Breathe, but uh, we call it Vibratory Pulmonary Drainage Simulation, trying to help drain the lungs of people that are suffering from COVID-19 crises. So COVID-19 issues, there's no vaccine, there's no robust treatment. Some patients for different reasons, mostly those with other syndromes like obesity, they experience uh, severe and uh, Jessica, you've muted me. You're unmuted, Maurice. I'm unmuted, okay, great. Uh, so in COVID-19 uh, issues, once intubated, the, the prognosis is not good. On average, uh, we have over a 25% death rate and it's highly variable among jurisdictions, depending on how early they intubate and many other factors. Lung congestion, lung blockage seem to be major issues. So as a mechanical person, as opposed to a biological person, I am wondering whether mechanical approaches can help us uh, treat patients, uh, treat patients to get, and get better outcomes. So this is what a ventilator looks like uh, to help people breathe. And I want you to notice in the background the bed. Notice the bed very carefully, okay? We'll come back to that later. So what do we do uh, in trying to cope with COVID-19? Well, we try to avoid, we try prophylaxis, disease prevention actions such as chemicals, bioagents, diet. We use treatment, anticoagulants, inflammation suppressants, etc. And of course, oxygenation through uh, intubation, either through the mouth or through a tracheotomy. And of course, the advice from Alberta Health uh, about a month, uh, two months ago almost now, is that all admitted COVID-19 patients should receive uh, prophylaxis to avoid hypercoagulation. In other words, a, uh, chemicals that uh, stop clotting of the blood in the, in the uh, circulatory system. Uh, there's other things like this uh, hydrochloroquine, which has been in the news a lot, and it is still unclear as to whether or not there is any benefit from it. Although there's a claim here that it helped prevent COVID-19 in the workers. And many articles discussing the uh, lessons that are learned, but uh, things are not uh, really very positive. So here are some of the chemistry and biology uh, suggestions, and there's many of them, of course. Uh, alpha blockers, anticoagulants, inflammation suppressants, etc., to reduce cell damage. And the efficacy of these techniques is not well defined uh, at the present time. We know that Bonnie Henry has done a stellar job uh, in British Columbia from the very beginning, thanks in part to her SARS experience. And uh, BC certainly leads Canada in terms of response to this uh, pandemic. Uh, and here is a statement from BC a few weeks ago. There are no proven therapies. I'll just go to the bottom phrase. Patients should be aware of the risks and benefits of novel therapies and with efficacy and safety data collected to inform the larger community. In other words, we don't have strong proven therapies at the present time, and there seems to be little prospect of that until we have a, a uh, some form of a, of a vaccine. So serious problems lead to intubation, and again, I want you to notice the head-up position of the patient. In my view, the head-up position is the worst possible thing that you can do during intubation. I'll come back to that. So as the killer strikes, it produce, proceeds down your uh, respiratory tract into your lungs. It impacts the alveoli, infl infection, inflammation. If your body reacts excessively strongly, then you get into this uh, cytokine storm and uh, you're in real trouble. 
cellular damage, uh, detritus from the broken down cells accumulates in your lungs, uh, fluids pool and oxygen take up declines. Death may be from oxygen starvation. It may be from sepsis in the organs uh, if uh, the COVID-19 virus gets into your internal organs. So focusing on the lungs, here's the uh, lung structure with the major uh, distributory uh, tube, the trachea. And uh, then we have, of course, the bronchi, which is the reticulated network that distributes uh, the uh, air uh, to all of the alveoli. Those are the little alveoli sacs. Each one contains a number of alveoli. And uh, we have uh, 300 to 500 million alveoli. And the internal surface area is 50 to 75 square meters in order to aid the diffusion of oxygen into the uh, blood. So at a small scale, we have the uh, bronchi, again, bringing in the air. Uh, we have the alveoli sacs, comprised of a, of a group of alveoli. Uh, we have the uh, capillaries. And uh, we have the blood flow coming in and going out. Coming in, oxygen poor, going out, oxygen rich. Arterial blood is oxygen rich, venous blood is oxygen poor. The uh, single cell thickness membrane between the uh, internal part of the alveoli and the capillaries is, a good, is good for oxygen diffusion. So inflammation appears to be focused in the region between the capillaries and the single cell wall of the alveoli leading to de de uh, damage and cell death and that's a problem. And it, you need to enhance oxygenation to sustain patients, uh, to, to keep people alive. It also is linked to a diminished ability to clear debris and mucus from the lungs because you're on your back, your head is up, you've got a tube down your throat and you can't cough. So any lung clearing technologies should help oxygen transfer until the, unless the membrane is, is totally destroyed. And it may be that early on in the congestion phase and post treatment as well, and for other lung ailments that uh, mechanical uh, aids and mechanical vibrations might help the uh, process. So, we're going to go through some clues here. Here's an ultrasound lung assessment. And uh, ultrasound allows you nowadays to do real-time imaging of the lung condition. And that's really good news because we need a metric to measure our success. So it's really valuable. Here's something else I downloaded recently. Uh, on the bottom, it says the patients have increased work of breathing fatigue or a worrying trajectory. That increased work of breathing and fatigue, that's my emphasis. And uh, that's a concern. They cannot drain their lungs. So let's look at some clues. In cystic fibrosis, back thumping helps clear the lungs. It helps get the mucus or the phlegm out of the lungs and allows better uh, oxygenation, allows cystic fibrosis patients to, to breathe more easily. Please notice the head down tilted position. In the oil industry, and that's my background in part, the energy industry, the oil industry, uh, we know that uh, vibratory energy can help clear the particles that block a well bore and allow better uh, production of oil from water from a water well, because a water well will also become blocked with particles. Broad frequency and low frequencies are needed to loosen the debris and help clear the passageway. Another clue at a much larger scale, in fact, is creating transit the reservoir, and that improves the flow of the flow of water or, or oil, liquids, in the pore structure. You create a very strong high amplitude pulse, and it actually dilates the pores and helps take the fluid in and expel the fluid outwards as the pressure pulsing waves pass through at a velocity of about 45, 50 meters uh, per second. Very, very slow waves. Low frequency and high amplitudes are necessary. Ah, another clue from steam-assisted gravity drainage technology, which has been developed and perfected in, in Alberta and is now more and more being used worldwide. We put in steam, and the steam rises to the top gravitationally, and the hot oil that is being melted by the steam, uh, it goes down to the bottom to be produced. 
In other words, the vapor phase rises, the liquid phase drops in gravity drainage. I found this uh, from a few weeks ago. Letting patients lie face down boosts their chances of surviving. I would also go further. I would say lying patients face down with a tilt angle of five, six, seven, eight degrees will be even better. The prone positioning reduces the pressure put on the lungs, allows the airways to more easily open, and surely, surely we can design a bed that can do this and, uh, and help the process. So gravity drainage is important. And in a little bit of levity, here's a good example of the, uh, of the impact of gravity on a well-known drink, the B52, which uh, contains different fluids of different density. But the key thing is, is that the light fluids are on top. You could put a little bit of vodka on top and it wouldn't mix because it's lighter than all of the three others, which all contain more and more sugar. Going back to another clue, the improved ultrasonic imaging that we can now use to monitor what's going on. So here's our proposed solution, and we'd like to try it out. We uh, would like to uh, develop a suitable mechanical aid for lung drainage, but we know now because the different scale of the alveoli, the detritus and the lungs, we know that we need low, uh, low frequency and high amplitude energy, vibrational energy to aid the uh, fluid flow. We know that we need higher frequencies to activate the small particles, and we need ultrasonics to allow real-time imaging and, and uh, we need, in other words, a wide range of frequencies. So that means we need different transducers that we can control, both the frequency and the amplitude. We know that we want patients face down, somewhat tilted. We want to monitor oxygen, respiration, blood pressure, sputum, other signs to try to uh, improve uh, and optimize based upon metrics, based upon measurements of what, what is happening in the lungs with the ultrasonics. So essentially then we have really four different systems uh, in, the, uh, in, in the process, all computer controlled for amplitude and, uh, and application and frequency. Okay, so what we're doing is we're transferring energy into the lungs. And we can use various techniques to do this, but there's something also quite important. We can uh, start making particles move and that can help them. But the last item is important. It appears that mucus and phlegm are shear thinning liquids. I'll come back. So on the left, you see a phased array, which allows you to uh, create a wave front, or uh, if you're trying to uh, do a medical procedure, you can actually focus these waves so that they, they focus inside the body at a point. And that's how we destroy kidney stones using uh, ultrasonic uh, frequencies. And you can see an old, old image of a fetus in, uh, in utero uh, on the right. We know that we can transfer quite a bit of energy acoustically with low frequencies. So if you set your uh, speakers on very low frequency and you have the right kind of technology, you can actually charge your cell phone. This technology does not exist, but it was written about in Scientific American about six years ago. We know that we can heat tumors inside the body by focused ultrasonic uh, approaches, Australian work. And you can even buy what's called an ultrasonic particle mobilization device to clean your skin with ultrasonics. I, hey, I, I don't know if this one works, but uh, uh, personally, I'm not going to rush out and buy it, but we're transferring mechanical energy into the flesh, into your skin. And the Electroflow Airway Clearance Device, which is a one frequency thumper, uh, is uh, has been used by, uh, by some people for air. Now, we know that ultrasonics can reduce the viscosity of some crude oils. We also know that low frequencies can reduce the viscosity of a liquid by shear thinning. Mucus, phlegm is strongly shear thinning. Low frequencies carry much more energy. So if we can vibrate this material, the viscosity will drop and people can drain their lungs more easily then. And you know this because uh, when you put ketchup on your hamburger, the ketchup uh, is a shear thinning fluid and you have to create some shear in order to get it onto your hamburger. Do the experiment yourself. At a microscopic scale, the detritus and the particles that are blocking the pores 
in a porous medium, and this would be say a water well from which you're trying to extract uh, groundwater to drink, uh, these tend to block the pores like you see on the diagram. And I'm just gonna skip to the next slide here because I want to draw the analogy between this and the, uh, excuse me here, I have to, okay, great. Uh, the analogy between this and the porous uh, structure of your lungs. So the vibrational energy brought to bear on the fluids and on the particles help perturb these blockages cause shear thinning, dislodge particles, and help everything move faster. So our model of the alveoli looks something like this. The alveoli in this case is filled with fluid because you're lying on your back, head up, and that allows fluid to pool in your lungs, not drain. And you've got detritus that is blocking, perhaps uh, the blocking the mouth of the alveoli. But we want air in these little sacs. So we apply vibratory pulmonary drainage stimulation using vibrational energy that has high accelerations. It helps dislodge particles and mobilize these fluids. The phlegm undergoes shear thinning, lung drainage, better oxygenation. That's our hypothesis. That's what we want to try because we believe that the outcomes for all types of pulmonary disorders would be improved. We don't know exactly what a device will look like. This is a very much of a, of a preliminary prototype in terms of scale. But remember that we have to have a device that's going to allow ultrasonic uh, energy to image. Uh, we're going to have ultrasonic energy, uh, perhaps in a different frequency range, to uh, excite the small particles. And we'll have uh, other transducers some of them are called Langevin transducers and acoustic, uh, subacoustic transducers, in other words, very low frequency, combined in, in one instrument so that we can uh, do a viscosity reduction by shear thinning and fluid excitation simultaneously while watching the images to see that we are indeed lung cleaning. And please understand that the metrics are quite important here. We want to be able to see progress. Here's how we want to do it. Instead of the therapist thumping on, this, on the patient with hands, the therapist is using a device, a computer output, a screen mo uh, monitoring. The patient is uh, on blood pressure monitoring, uh, blood oxygen monitoring, uh, lung uh, respiratory strength mo monitoring, et cetera. And we want the tilted position to promote gravity drainage of the lungs, even with intub intubation. So uh, this is a doctor in uh, Essex uh, in, uh, in uh, the United Kingdom who said the majority of your lung is on your back, not on the front, and by lying on your back, you're closing off more of the smaller airways. This is not a good position during a period of infection. I agree 100%. And I want to add that I would like to see the patient during active lung uh, clearance being tilted uh, at five to 10 degrees in a, in a bed that, that can do that easily. Here is, from the same news article, here is a view of patients uh, on their stomach, not on their back. And surely we can design a more comfortable bed that will allow patients to uh, drain their lungs more, more effectively with uh, the addition of the vibratory stimulation. Help patients breathe. That seems to be a critical thing in the treatment of COVID-19 and also in the treatment of other respiratory uh, syndromes that cause blockage of the lungs by uh, phlegm, mucus, and uh, by cellular uh, detritus that is sloughed off uh, as the uh, inflammation uh, continues. So uh, there are other biological and medical uh, and chemical agents that may very well be, be partially effective, but we think that if we can get oxygen to the lungs more freely, more effectively, then we will at least not uh, have patients drowning uh, from oxygen, dr drowning in their own lung fluids, essentially. Then uh, that's what I see every time I see a patient sitting up, intubated, face up, I just shudder and think we've got to do better than that because that contradicts a few laws of physics. 
So maybe this is not direct linear thinking because I'm a bit of a geophysicist myself. Uh, and, uh, but uh, just like we have a refraction of waves uh, through a block of glass, uh, the refraction of ideas through different disciplines might, might help a little bit in coming up with better treatment techniques. And this is one we'd like to develop and try. Uh, thank you, and if there's any questions, uh, please unmute your mics or send a chat, and I'll try to answer the questions. Hi, not really a chat, but one of the suggestions is uh, massage uh, beds. They're actually already a preset for laying down that way. That might be an area to look at first. That's very, that's a very good idea. I, my, my, my daughter is a doctor and I did talk to her about that. And she said that there are beds that allow a bit of tilting and that allow a face down position. They have a name for it. They call it the Trendelenburg prone position. So yeah, we're, we're aware of that, but we don't see them being used uh, for, for COVID patients. And that's a concern of mine. Yeah. Correct. Thank you. Yep. Um, yesterday, uh, my uh, grandson was over. He's got a tracheotomy tube. Uh, he was born 24 weeks, so he just turned a year yesterday. And I did an experiment for you that might have uh, some interest. Anyway, um, with a tracheotomy tube, uh, he gets um, lots and lots of fluid in his lung exactly like you're talking about and right. so on a regular basis they're actually um, uh, suctioning them on all day every day and it's you know it's quite a tedious uh, yes. experience now it just happened that he was sitting on my knee and I had my hands around his chest and could feel he was very rattly and it was interesting when uh, he was suction to actually feel it come from the lower extremes through that four inch um, suction tube. And yep. I actually got to feel the difference on what it meant from uh, going uh, rattly to clean in an instant. It was quite, it, it, I'd seen it done a thousand times, but yep. I'd never felt it done. And it's <laughs> very interesting in that case to actually uh, feel what, what the difference is Yes. Um, in, in his case. So it's very analogous to what you're talking about. Uh, well, basically, how do you get that out? And of course, with a tracheotomy tube, you just take the, uh, you know, the filter off and, and shove a four inch tube down, down there right. and uh, suction things out. But I actually felt it come right out. It was really uniquely interesting and uh, something I hadn't expected. Well, the uh, experienced massage therapist that uh, have been trained and have a lot of experience in treating cystic fibrosis uh, patients. And by the way, this is usually, usually a person at home that is helping to take care of the cystic fibrosis uh, uh, patient. They, uh, they, are, they, they, they put as much as 10 to 12 pounds force with each one of their, of their, of their blows. They cut their hand like this and go whomp, whomp on the back. Well, what that is, is low frequency, high amplitude, excitation of the fluids in the lungs, giving you that shear thinning. And it seems to me that uh, if we could extend the range of frequencies uh, to handle things like loosening that detritus, but the, of the low frequency thumping, then we would have a lot better outcomes. But uh, no, nobody's ever developed a tool that can vary the amplitudes and the frequencies in such a way that we can actually do optimization uh, in, a, in a clinical environment. So that's kind of our, our hope that we could possibly do that. Hmm. Um, just a, another one, like you're talking about low frequency ultrasonics. And uh, one of the things I've used on my back is, I don't know if you've seen Dr. Ho on TV with his electrical stimulator. Yeah. Uh, uh, if, have you ever used one? Yes, I have. Uh, I had uh, some knee problems a few years ago oh. and... Uh, hmm. They, they, they uh, did it on my, uh, on my thigh right above my knee to try to uh, help. And uh, I'm, I'm, I have no idea if it helped. I didn't have any good metrics. <coughs> Excuse me. That's a problem, Mark, is that 
those therapies don't have easy metrics. Whereas we know that if we have an ultrasonic imager, blood pressure, respiratory, measuring the respiratory efficacy, and measuring blood oxygenation all at the same time that we're treating a patient with a device that we can replicate, then we've got something we can work on because we can measure in real time how the patient is responding. And then we can vary the amplitude and the frequency of the different frequency ranges uh, and, and optimize it for, for, for different patients that may have you know, different properties, somewhat different properties in their lungs, for example. Mm -hmm. a, a young person, uh, uh, a child might have different elasticity in their lungs than a person of my age. I'm 74 later this year. Uh, and it might mean that we need somewhat different uh, amplitude and somewhat different frequency. On the yeah. other hand, I've got a, I'm a big guy with a big chest, so I, I can take a lot more amplitude than, say, a, a small woman, a 95-pound woman, uh, who uh, might be bruised by uh, the impact of a massage therapist that uh, force for impact. Yeah, more what I was uh, thinking of there was the fact that the uh, contact probes seem to work so well. Like on a yeah. little battery, you can go for months and months. And yeah. uh, it does actually sink very deep. And it's basically waves that you're putting in. I was just curious whether that might be a a better method to deliver the waves from the ultrasonic because those seem to get good service contact. Uh, yep. Not unsimilar to what's on the guy's back right in the picture there. Right. right. Yeah. It, it's uh, yeah, there's surface contact and then there's also severe attenuation with the high frequencies. The waves don't travel very far. Right. Right. Yeah. But, and, but if you were to connect onto the end and drive low frequencies through there, I don't know that uh, well i don't know if it would pass it as well because uh, yes yes it yeah, does yeah. this is a, a well-known characteristic of vibrational energy is that low frequencies travel huge distances uh without uh, as, as much attenuation that's why when you hear uh, lightning uh, pardon me when lightning strikes you hear the thunder if you're very close it's a huge crack that has all the, all of the frequencies in it but if it's 10 kilometers away you only hear the low frequency rumbling because all of the high frequencies have been filtered out. Right. It's the yeah, same thing in your in your lungs and your and your flesh. Is that the high frequencies get filtered out very very rapidly? And we also know from the oil industry with our with the technology that's been developed is that in order to excite fluid mobilization, in order to aid fluid mobilization, you need a lot of low frequency stuff, not not the high frequency stuff. Right. Uh, the yeah. low frequency stuff is what actually generates flu uh, or aids fluid movement. So yeah, something yeah. like the uh, they talk about six hertz and things like that. Of uh, that's right. Natural, yeah, down there uh, in the six hertz, yeah. maybe even uh, yeah. one hertz uh, range. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. that's correct. Yeah, 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 for sure. But one of the things that uh, might actually support uh, one of the things you're saying about the energy is um, uh, I used to do a lot of ultra uh, ultraviolet uh, or sorry infrared uh, stuff. We were using it for. Um, uh, the counterfeit in, in China a few years ago. But uh, right. one of the things is, is that um, I've noticed lately that uh, I guess you're aware of uh, UV lights for uh, getting rid of uh, uh, bacteria and things. It's typically yeah. done at 254 nanometers. Uh, and that level is enough to damage your retinas, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's, you have to be very careful with it. And it's because of the energy that it maintains it can actually go through a number of cells. Well, recently what they've done is started looking at 200, 222 nanometers, which is only 30 nanometers away. But oddly enough, because of the exponential nature of the energy that you're talking about, it decreases enough that the 222 nanometers cannot actually penetrate the um, tear layer on your eyes. It's just that weak that it can't go through. So well, that's a safe light. Send me a link to that if you would, please. Uh, I think sure. you have my email. Uh, yeah, it's in the in the invite. Yeah, okay, yeah. send me a link to that, and I'll tell you why. Because my uh, my son is working as a salesman for a company that has uh, uh, been selling uh, LEDs and light products, and one of their latest products is uh, UV uh, sterilization of uh, right. circulating air. 
for exactly that reason, for the uh, bacterial uh, suppression. Yeah, yeah and, and, and 254 has been the standard for years. I have one. We used to do them, but now there's 222. And there is one company that's actually making them. So you could actually put them in a room. Uh, yeah. For instance, in that room that they're there, you could turn them on and, and it wouldn't damage uh, do any damage, which is very interesting. But it goes, so I'll send you the link, but it goes to what you were saying about um, uh, energy in that it's uh, logarithmic up at that level. Yeah. And that, of course, would be true down at the bottom as well, yeah. inversely. And uh, you see, so, you see, this is why we need to have a, a device that is. I mean, we know cystic fibrosis back thumping works. We know that. Mm -hmm. We also know that if you tilt pa you know, patients up, face down, uh, tilt patients on their stomach, face down, we know that helps. But when it comes to the other ranges of vibrational frequencies, the literature is, is devoid of information that will give me good clues as to what frequency or aptitude range we need uh, for that, for, for, uh, for, for that uh, therapeutic value. So yep. On a device that's like why that. clinical research has to be done in, in order to make this into a, a, potential, a potential method. Yeah, yeah now on a, on a device like that, would you be able to produce any resonant frequencies? Are you able to produce anything? Uh, We've talked about that a lot. Uh, one of the problems is that uh, all of your uh, internal organs, your lungs, the, the material around your lungs, your ribs, uh, have slightly different impedances and slightly different frequency characteristics. So there well, is no resonant frequency. No, but uh, that's that, a good thing. Uh, uh, my curiosity is, I was thinking about it recently, is, uh, you know, and this goes back to, they think the Egyptians did it way back when is that you know they use resonant frequencies to do various things and and there's a lot of uh out in the weeds uh theories about right. you know a, a resonant frequency if you got the right one for something this small because you know when you compare a virus to a bacteria it's thousands of times smaller and one of the things that uh, we were doing was we were trying to we were using we use ozone to uh get rid of COVID-19. Basically yeah. ozone in water, um, it's 3,000 times more powerful and, uh, or 3,000 times faster and 30 times more powerful than bleach, right? And wow. uh, it just instantly, as soon as it touches it, it just destroys it. Um, the, you know, the lipid layer around it gets instantly yeah, yeah. destroyed uh, when it comes in contact with ozone. And ozone in water breaks down and turns over to, um, uh, oxygen in about 10 to 15 minutes. So what you can do is you can pour it in a river and that's where all the fish and stuff start growing. So you actually, you know, do good things. We use that in the, um, in the agriculture industry uh, okay. to clean the water and, and push it through. But uh, recently we sent one out to the uh, class three facility in Winnipeg and they're going to test it and see how well it works on COVID because I've basically got a power washer. that You just spray it on any surface Right. from any distance gone instant clean and with no residue left over anyway the point being is that i'm very familiar with the level of strength that the lipid layer has and yep. it's very very low it's one one layer thick and if you break that the rna falls all over the place it just it's well, gone right that's and, that's that's how that's why they say wash your hands because the lipid layer exactly. uh, on the uh, so, covid 19 uh, virus is uh, is weak to uh, surfactants. Exactly, and uh, so, and that just destroys it. So, and one of the things I was curious about is if you ever run across it, find the resonant frequency of that layer. And you're right, all the other things have different resonant frequencies and they would be unaffected, but because that's so small, that is, has been one of my curiosities lately. I was well, just wondering about it. I think though that, uh, that your point again uh, deserves emphasis because, uh, Different structures of different sizes respond to different frequencies. Yeah, yeah and, exactly. And, and alveoli uh, itself, which uh, is getting up to you know, a, a millimeter, it, it is hugely larger than a, than a cell. Yeah. Or, or even much, much larger than the uh, detritus from a cell that has been uh, killed and is broken into particles. Mm -hmm. So we, that if you do a bit of a calculation, you realize that there's about four orders of magnitude uh, that you have to uh, uh, do excitation. 
and to excite the macroscopic size above the millimeter, you, you need the low frequencies and high amplitudes, but for the small detrital, detritus, uh, the, the, the debris, you need a very high frequencies. So that's why we're convinced that you need a range of frequencies. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. It's kind of like that guy down in uh, Australia that they never figured out how he did it. He was boiling water with a frequency and uh and he died before he told anybody how he did it right okay but, you know he said and uh you know there was lots of films so it's always been an ongoing research task to try to find out you know how this guy boiled water yeah. with a resonant frequency right uh, anyway just the frequencies of particular value have yeah. different impacts on different things and so the area that you're um looking at is is very interesting it's, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of possibility for that, you know, from various things. And if you had something that would range from one end to the other, of course, you could actually try that and see what the effect on it was, yeah. right? Uh, go from end to end and, and uh, just get the results, which is why my question earlier, are you able to basically create any frequency? Because it would be interesting to go through some variations and see what impact they're actually having on these particular. And that echoes back to the real need for a real time uh, measurements. Exactly. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, so how do you, once you release this, what's your expectation on removing it? So now you've got it, the viscosity down, it's, it's now sitting there. Now what's the expectation? Cause you can't cough. You can't cough. That's why I want the patients tilted face down. Gravity drainage works. Oh, okay. Okay. It works very yeah. well in the oil industry. And it would just drip it out. Is, that would be the ex expectation? My expectation is that uh, these patients that you see in the image on the screen uh, would be uh, tilted at, you know, seven, eight degrees, something like that, with the bottom of their lungs at a higher elevation than the top of their lungs, uh, helping, uh, helping the drainage. Well, uh, then my suggestion would be when you get the frequency and you think you're right, go uh, and list some people with uh, tracheotomy tubes and ask them to give you a hand because they'd be able to tell you uh, right off the bat how that yeah. worked. And because they do, I think they do it on a regular basis. So it would be yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, some positive feedback you could get instantly. And in but you know, oh, it's not. It's you know, the right the right posture is not is is, is not n a new idea. It, it's no. just yeah. it's just to me that I see these images all the time on, on the media of COVID patients with the COVID patients with a chew coming out of their mouth, and they've got their chest at an at an angle and their face up, which yeah. is just making them drown in their own foods. No, the prone position I've been hearing that for a significant amount of time now, and uh, it's been coming out of different areas. So they're saying that's that's much better way to do it because yeah. they don't uh, drown basically is uh, one of the problems so you can get the stuff down there but it's like you say they just keep filling up with fluid and yeah. uh you know the alveoli is damaged at that point there's all kinds of stuff in there coming from every different direction so uh, yeah. they just aren't working very well so uh but hopefully they'll uh, i was just watching us in sweden yesterday and you know they said uh, their big problem is oxygen they're finding that that's the biggest problem is they haven't been doing a good enough job with oxygen before they get in. And so your best solution is to stop them before they get to this point. So if you yes, can- Yes, 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 exactly. Yeah. The moment you have the first signs of congestion, uh, yeah. Yeah. you know, start the process right away. Yeah. yeah, no, this is one of my complaints about the way they did it because we had the 1919 Spanish flu where they didn't have all all the equipment that you're looking at on this picture. So basically, if you ever got to this level, you were dead by definition. Yes. So their thing was is to, uh, you know, use. Um, well, it was J.L. Kellogg, the guy from the Corn Flakes, who did the, uh, um, you know, hot, um, you know, like heating up uh, hydrotherapy. Uh, yes. Basically, was his thing, is that it boosts people's immune systems so they don't get to that point. You know, yeah. oxygen is one of the things that they're really complaining about that they could be doing now uh, and that uh, could actually do a lot of help. And, and it seems that they're not getting that because they're not well equipped, especially, um, and that's the difference between a hospital and a, uh, old, uh, and a care home, is care homes are typically not all rigged in rooms for oxygen. So now they have to find a different way to pipe it in. Whereas in a hospital, you'd take it off the wall right there. 
And uh, so that's one of the things that would, uh, uh, my understanding is they're desperate to get that now because they know that that helps so much and stops them from getting to the, to the point where typically at the beginning of this pandemic, they would say, you're not there, don't bother, go home, come back when you're almost dead and then we'll, we'll yeah. pull the miracles out and <laughs> save you as opposed to, no, no, stop them from going any farther. That's, very, that's, that's, that's such, a, such, a bizarre, uh, such a bizarre comment. Uh, yeah. Go home until you're almost dead and then, uh, yeah. and then come in and we'll see if we can save you. Yeah. Right. And, and that just seemed to be such a wrong thing because, yeah. uh, you know, the percentages when you work at that level, if you work them backwards, uh, you know, the 25% that, uh, well, actually, I think it's closer to 50. These people in these positions here, they're, uh, one of them is going to go, right? It's about a 50-50. And because of that, it, the more that you can keep out of there, if you could, out of 10 people, you could stop five. Well, you just save two and a half people, right? Uh, sure. You know, phenomenal uh, but amount. It's, it's, it's not just saving people's lives. Uh, I, I am completely convinced. Uh, of course, naturally, I'll, I'll change my mind when confronted with the facts. <laughs> But I'm completely convinced that, uh, you know, when you do undergo a severe case of uh, the cytokine storm, that, you know, inflammation in your lungs, that uh, the damage you're doing is not, I mean, in the Globe and Mail the other day, we, we read about a fellow in great health, you know, uh, mild blood pressure. That was the only real thing he had. Mm -hmm. And he survived intubation. But that was six weeks or seven weeks ago. And he's having a lot of trouble getting back. And well, a lot yeah. of that probably has to do with lung damage. Exactly, and, and that's one of the problems because obviously, you, you know, the, the damage that you look at individual alveoli, if you multiply that by 500 million, it's going to be uh, pretty significant. And uh, there's no two ways that this is, this is gonna have long-term. And that's exactly right because 100% of the pneumonia uh, and pneumonia-like symptoms are post. It's after you get it and the damage has happened. And, you know, so that's where it, it's actually quite a problem. If you could stop that secondary damage from happening, although, uh, you know, there is a little bit of a light on that because uh, is it as uh, pain? Um, you know, some cheap drug that they're finding works actually quite well with uh, after the fact, once you've got it. If you were to take it before, because people want to stock up on all these things, right? it will actually make it worse. Well, you take it after, it actually uh, attacks the secondary infection and, and has a little bit of gain on that. The jury's still out. Yeah, the two principles that I like to apply to my own life. Uh, take an external medicine before you take an internal medicine. That's one. So for example, if I've got achy knees, uh, well, I'm gonna use uh, Voltaren which, which uh, uh, applies ibuprofen externally right? rather than taking it internally. Yep. And number two, uh, if there is a physical uh, beneficial uh, ben benefit, a physical uh, treatment, physical therapy that's beneficial, try that before you start taking drugs. That's, well, the, yeah. that's the way I run my life. Uh, yeah, what they should yeah. be doing is putting hot tubs in all these old age homes. <laughs> that would help. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It would help the it would help the economy too. All the all the yeah. hot tub sales. Are, so, but anyway, no, I think that's good. I think uh, yeah, as as you analyze, but I'd, I'd I'd be curious to look at a variety of spectrums once you had a um, something that could go through and and uh, you know as as you're testing and. Uh, there might be some interesting uh, possibilities there. Uh, there, there very well may be. I mean, we, yeah. uh, we, we just saw on, the, on a Globe and Mail uh, obituary here, uh, let's see, it would be either Saturday or Friday, a young doctor, I believe in his late 40s, who passed on, and this is the guy that uh, actually showed that you can, uh, on, you can on block um, clots in, uh, in the circulatory system I believe it's in the uh, arterial side, uh, by focused ultrasound, mm -hmm. focusing it on a very, very small volume, and it causes uh, micro bubbles, uh, essentially vaporizing, uh, micro bubbles to form, and it breaks up the clot. And right. there's another application of ultrasonics. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. And uh, I, believe there's, I believe there's dozens and dozens of them 
that uh, if you looked at the right place and, and you have the right application, this course looks like one of them. So that would be good. Maybe we can clear, maybe we can clear plaque from the inside of uh, our, oh, our, nice. yeah. our veins well, using focused ultrasonic, who knows? Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's, it's not unrealistic actually when you think about that because you know sound is very powerful. We really don't know a whole uh, as much as we uh, think we do about it. And uh, that's where uh, things like resonant frequencies come into theories and stuff, because what happens when you overlay a number of things, you know, like, a, 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 well, a plaque, for instance, exactly. If you found a resonant frequency of plaque, it would do exactly that. Uh, you know, just blow it apart and okay, now it flushes out, right? So, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, for sure. So very interesting area to, to look at. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Anybody else want to uh, discuss? Um, yes, Professor. Isaac, go ahead. Thank you, Prof. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I'm just curious about um, gravity drainage. Is it, um, you said specifically that it works in the oil and oil industry, has it been used in the medical field previously or is your assessment based on what, just on the uh, oil industry alone? Well, gravity drainage will always work because dense phases will drop and light phases will rise. Like, for example, if we have a natural gas pipeline and it ruptures, People uh, always think that the, that the natural gas will spread along the ground and then there'll be a huge explosion. And that never Methane is less than half of the atomic weight of air. So the methane is extremely buoyant and it just shoots straight up into the atmosphere and doesn't spread on the ground. On the other hand, if you have carbon dioxide that escapes from a tank, it's heavier than air and it stays close to the ground and it suffocates people. So it's the same thing with fluids and gases. In the oil industry, I talked about steam assisted gravity drainage, but we also have something that we call inert gas gravity drainage. So we inject inert gas into a reservoir and it moves to the top of the reservoir and then helps displace the liquids downwards where we can produce them. So if your lungs, are if you have the, the bottom of your lungs higher than, the, than your trachea, than your throat, you've got then a, a built-in pressure gradient that's going to allow those fluids to drain. And if they drain, then they are replaced by air. So that's the key factor in the, in the gravity drainage of your lungs. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, I think it's, uh, let's see, 10 minutes to two. Is there anyone else that would like to uh, make a comment or contribute or ask a question? All right, thank you. The, uh, this presentation has been recorded and will be posted on the WISE website. If you're interested, please uh, pass the link on to your friends and uh, and uh, I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions via email as well. So uh, I'm signing off now. Uh, take care and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Prof.